since I was playing a lot. I don't I don't think that's quite right because um actually I'll go ahead and uh let's see. Well there's not an easy way to share this right now, but if you look at the code for to duckdb under the hood, it's just calling um duckdb register arrow from the duckdb package. And so uh it sh should be it's just it is a duckdb con um but it's like it's still it's reading that it, it's it's using the the parquet as like the source of the database still so it's a virtual duckdb just like you were saying but i, I think it's still using the duckdb backend dbi backend um let me um, yeah i'm not sure yeah I, but, I, uh, yeah I, I think my understanding is that it goes from parquet as an arrow stream to the db represented there as a virtual table virtual table and then you are uh, facing the db um from db prior which uses the DBI connection objects with the DuckDB uh, driver. And at least Kirill Muller has confirmed that that step converted to a data frame right now. So in effect, the arrow to DuckDB already provides the front end for DB player, but using the DuckDB driver, um, which is set to convert it to a data frame. So okay. it's actually the, the optimization would be between the parquet and the DB using an arrow right. stream, but still it does not, but it, it's a more recent development. The fact that you can also now use the arrow stream to extract data from the DB. Up to now, it was still converted to a data frame. So when uh, Kirill Muller has implemented the ADBI package, which has another type of driver to do that in effect, to, to support the arrow um, export from the DB. But I was a bit surprised that he wanted me to make that issue <laughs> it's in the DB. So it seems as if he wants to do that in there as well. But I'm, okay. I'm just guessing, I'm just guessing. Yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm not getting it right. I Yeah, I don't know. Um, I we'll get to that section of the chapter and talk about <laughs> yeah. it then i All felt right. a little bit uh cheated at the end um yeah. that they're, they're like hey yeah and you can do this but there's no explanation of okay why like and so anyway we'll get there so let me um let's go ahead and uh actually before i start do the um bookkeeping um I've got this week. Gabby's going to do next week. I won't uh, be able to attend, but uh, you know, please do hold the meeting, assuming at least two of you will be there. Uh, the week after that, I will cover. That's the Arvest chapter, basically. And then uh, Nelson was saying that if he's available, he'll do functions. That's a little bit up in the air. Then we have uh, Floris on iteration. And finally, that last chapter, which is unclaimed. Oh, sorry, that's not the last chapter. There are three chapters. Um, I will say, if we are on schedule, that 28th, I don't think I will be available in June. Um, but we can sort that out as we get closer. That's too bad, though, because I actually kind of want to do that one. <laughs> um, yeah, we're looking good. We got the last or the next couple of weeks lined up at least. Hopefully, uh, for this one, I won't like I I even put this one on my to do. This arrow chapter had it all ready, and then it fell back off of my to do apparently until this morning. I was like, oh crap, I have a chapter to prepare. So, all right. Anyway, uh okay. So yeah, we'll we'll sort it out. Uh, we'll see what everyone's available availability is as we get there and yeah um we can mix it up there will be at least two or three of us and you know hopefully nelson unless it's 
not Nelson because he has a new job that's keeping him busy and happy, and then that would be fine. <laughs> so, all right, now I will get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, Data Science Learning Community R4DS Book Club, Cohort 10. Uh, today we're going to talk about Chapter 22, Arrow. Um, and so what we want to learn to do is to use Arrow, the Arrow package, to load large data files into R efficiently. <clears throat> we're going to partition large data files into Parquet files for quicker access, less memory usage, and quicker wrangling. And then we're going to wrangle arrow data using existor de existing dplyr operations. And actually, there should be one in here that we're going to very briefly discuss the connection between arrow and DuckDB. Or the book is going to very briefly discuss that. We'll see how, how much time the club spends on that. All right. So uh, you know, the question that we need to answer is, why learn arrow? Um, I will say, you know, like if you if your options are CSV or uh, Arrow with CSV, and you're using large CSVs, then Arrow is definitely the way to go. Uh, it can read those large data sets relatively quickly, but most importantly, it can, like, it becomes possible to work with them. They, you can work with CSVs yeah. that are too big to fit in RAM, <laughs> whereas if you just tried to read them straight up, uh, they wouldn't fit. Couple of crazy dogs. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, just to, we'll talk about this a lot more. But the, there's also that that the Arrow package works with the Parquet data or Parquet format, which is like meant to be uh, usable across different languages, notably you know Python and R, but also other languages as well. And it's good for large data sets. Um, so that's the general idea. And then the arrow package lets you just use dplyr on these giant things without having to load the whole thing into RAM. Uh, so I, I threw um, curl in here. We do briefly use the curl package. It's gonna, you probably already have curl installed because it's used by, uh, like I think even reader when it's downloading files from the internet is using curl, but um, these are the packages we're working with today. Arrow, curl, little tiny bit with DuckDB, and then just various things from the tidyverse. Um, there is this giant data set that if you can, it is nice to actually download this and play with it. It is very big and can take a long time to download. Um, and they uh, point out, like, don't just use a normal, like even, you know, try to read it with reader from the remote location or even try to download file or download it through your browser. This curl multi-download does a better job of uh, downloading giant files and gives you a progress update and it's just relatively nice to use. So uh, I do recommend doing that. I definitely did not check it into our uh, repository for the book because it would like kill the entire repository. So let's not do that. Actually, I don't think it would even be possible to check it in. Uh, he has a formula in here that very roughly speaking, the size in memory for a CSV is roughly twice whatever it is on the disk. So if you have a 10 megabyte file on the disk, it'll be about 20 megabytes in memory. Um, and you can see how if it's, you know, a nine gigabyte file, then that's going to take up a lot of memory and you might not be able to fit that. Um, and so instead of using read CSV from reader, um, we can use arrow open data set, which will um, scan it, but it doesn't actually load it. Like it loads a representation of the data set. Um, it's then he points out that it scans a few thousand rows. In this case, there's this ISBN field that's empty for 80,000 rows. So if we just rely on arrow, it's going to think that that's an empty column and uh, it probably defaults to calling that a logical. That's what reader would do at least. And so we tell it what it is. I, I can't remember if it defaults or if it just fails because it can't figure it out. But one way or the other, you want to tell it what that is. Um, but the really important thing is it doesn't actually 
load this data set into memory. And so you don't have to have enough memory to fit the entire data set. You just have to be able to load kind of a representation of the data set. And if we glimpse it, it tells us that it's this file system data set with one, one CSV one file. Question. One question yep. may. Okay. Um, in the previous, so that is if you know there is a column ESBM. Yeah. Um, but how <laughs> would you go on with uh, if you? I I I think if it's so big a uh, uh, a data set, you will have a a dictionary or something about it because if you have something big and you maybe wanna at least peek at what the, the columns are and uh, to then decide or give a, have an idea, can you still use them and without specifying and then do a, a, a second run? Yeah, uh, I can't specify? like I can't remember if it shows you or if it errors or if it loads it wrong. Um, but one way or the other, it will let you know which ones it had trouble with. Like either when you look at the data set or when you, uh, or I, th I think it tells you just as it loads. I don't have it handy right now to test that out. And then and the fallback usually is if you're not sure, if you load it as a string, you'll have the data there to figure out what to do with it. Um, if it's a giant data set, hopefully you don't have to do that. Um, but that's one way you can fall back and kind of deal with things. Um, yeah, that is something where in a real, I felt like this chapter was just, it's a good introduction, but if you're really working with Arrow, you're going to want to be reading the Arrow documentation probably uh, a fair amount because real data sets, you run into things like that of, um, oh, oh no, I don't know what this column is supposed to be and it's failing to load and now I have a whole thing that I have to do to deal with that. And so... Yeah, uh, hopefully there will be a data dictionary that'll help you figure that out. Um, but when there isn't, you have to do some trial and error usually, which you can do. And it, it's a little bit slow, or not not slow, but it, it takes a little bit of time to do this opening of the data set, but not anything really super significant. Um, maybe if you start getting into a really, really gigantic CSV, but when you're getting into CSVs that big, the people creating it, wouldn't have been able to create it and so like uh hopefully they're limited by not if, if they don't know to give you a data dictionary hopefully they also don't know how to create a csv that big um yeah there so in the chat there are um a number of really good talks online actually nick has done quite a lot of them nick crane um but there are lots of good talks about arrow so uh as you're getting into it i think that's a good thing to go find um it can be a little tricky finding you know search for our ladies arrow or uh maybe apache arrow things like that because just googling arrow obviously isn't going to give you a lot of good information arrow data arrow parquet that'll probably get it all right so now when we do glimpse like we can use the normal glimpse function from dplyr and it shows us what it is. Uh, there are some interesting things happening here. So uh, the first thing is this file system data set. That's where it's not really loaded. It's just like represented in your memory. So it's saying it's really in a file system. It does know though that it has 41 million rows and 12 columns. And then it's going to tell you what type of columns those are in the arrow uh, data types not the R data types, which is kind of interesting. So it's not that it's a character, it's a string. Uh, it's not just an integer, but it's a big integer and int64, int and then these are all strings. It was interesting to see that the glimpse will only work on the uh, direct uh, file system data set and not on a pipeline. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I, tr I tried it. I tried it just to know, and um, yeah, I'm not sure if if it errors, but at least it gives a message uh, to tell that it cannot see. You have to collect first. Um, that is a a interesting point, and kind of save that thought the last slide because I think that is adding to what is the purpose 
of uh, the DuckDB pipe. So, um, yeah, that is like Arrow definitely implements parts of dplyr and then it has like parts of lubridate and has parts of string stringer or string i i can't remember if it's one or the other um but not everything and so you will run into things sometimes where you're like oh surely it no that doesn't work okay um and i've i've definitely had that the few times i've actually worked with arrow um they are constantly like uh improving so you know, it always might show up, but there are ways around that too as well. All right. Um, but we can use dplyr to uh, manipulate the function or the data. So, you know, we have this Seattle CSV, we can group by, check out year, summarize, arrange, and then collect at the end here, just like we saw in the previous chapter, that actually, like actually does it. Um, I should have done a version that doesn't have the collect because it'll kind of tell you, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm sorry, this is what was already there slash what was in the book, but uh, and we'd see one later where we don't collect. So we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it just like it, before you collect, it figures out what it will do, but it doesn't actually do all the, you know, looking at uh, all of the checkouts to see um, how things will work or figuring out all the groups or all that kind of thing. It doesn't go all the way until you collect it. All right. Um, but all of that is still pretty slow. Like this, uh, run here, I think it takes about 10 seconds to do, well, to actually collect, like all the other steps are basically instantaneous, but the collect step takes about 10 seconds. Um, it's faster than just, if you tried to use that same data set with reader, it would just crash, uh, unless you have a insane amount of RAM on your machine. Uh, even then it would take forever. Um, so it's it's better if you got just a CSV to to use Arrow uh, open data set, but much faster is if you can take that CSV, uh, convert it to Parquet and then use, use Arrow with it. Now, I will say if you are just like exploring a CSV once and you will never open that again, in that case, there's no point to do parquet because you've already like done it. Although actually it's still while you're doing all your various collecting, it still could be a pain. It's, but it, it's, it takes a long time or not a long time, but it takes some time to convert to parquet. So just factor that in um, that you might have to deal with that, but it doesn't take that long, you know, that much playing with the data before the parquet conversion would be worth it. Um, we're going to go into this a little bit more. We're going to see an example, but the one of the big things that Parquet can or Parquet does to make this faster is it subdivides the data. As long as you tell it how to do it, it will subdivide the data into different files so that depending on what the manipulation you're doing is, it won't have to look at some of the files. It can just ignore those. Um, and so that's a big part of how it speeds things up. And actually, we've got more on the next thing. So uh, the benefits of Parquet is that there's smaller files than CSV. So even though it's these multiple files, if you add them up, they are smaller. And the reason for that is that it uses more efficient encodings to store everything. It's not just a giant string. Um, and it does some compression. Um, it stores the data, data types. So CSV just writes everything as strings, as, as uh, you know, text. Uh, and then when you load it back in, it has to kind of figure out, oh, yeah, that looks like an integer. But once uh, once you know that the data is an integer, the Parquet can save it as that integer. It'll, it'll keep that uh, formatting. Um, it's column oriented. So it, it thinks like a data frame where each column of data is stored and, and um, accessible rather than row oriented, like a CSV is uh, has to load all the row at a time. Um, and yes, an RDS actually, uh, if you are working purely in R, well, even then the RDS has to load all the way into RAM. So the advantage is still that Parquet doesn't have to load the whole thing into RAM. But yes, an RDS also will, will keep the data type. Um, yeah, a lot of times I will work with RDSs uh, 
pretty much any time I can. There's the whole controversy right now that this will probably be dated in like a month because no one will care anymore. But there was the big uh, vulnerability in RDSs. But uh, it's a known feature. It's don't open RDSs from people you don't know or don't trust. Just like you shouldn't open any binary file from people you don't trust. Um, it is possible for people to do crazy things with RDSs. I don't think those things are possible with Parquet, but that's because Parquet doesn't have the same types of uh, promises and things that RDSs can have. So, um, so if you hear about that, there like there's a little bit of a discussion on the the Slack. Yeah, I mean it can. It's possible for bad things to happen. Like if the tidyverse team were really bad at what they do and they let someone check in a new version of one of their data sets that they have stored as an rds in a package then that would get out to a lot of people because it's, it can be kind of invisible that this uh vulnerability is in there anyway that's a big side thing it's unlikely to happen and there are ways to deal with it so um go ahead regarding, sorry regarding uh csv files if you read them with arrow i think they can also be larger than memory and support that aspect uh it, i think that that would be similar even though it's yeah. slower right uh, so it's not that you cannot uh, take large csv files i think um which, yeah right yeah so it could, yeah it, it still can deal with the giant CSVs, it just has to do that processing. And so that's where it will be slow. And if you're doing a lot of different work with the CSVs, um, that's where it's useful to go ahead and write it out as a parquet because uh, it won't have to keep reprocessing the CSV, basically. Not, yeah, at, as not an exactly arrow, right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the disadvantage in all this is. Uh, you know, CSVs are human readable. You can look at it and understand what data is in it. And uh, Parquet is a like binary file. It doesn't, it's not going to mean anything to you if you try to look at the contents of the file. All right. So um, the way or a big way of um, how it gets all this advantage from Parquet files is uh, partitioning. That's where it splits data across files so that Again, if you aren't using some of the data, like if you, there are years you're not using in your data, you can just skip those files entirely. Um, he says that you'll likely need to experiment to find the best partition partition for your data. Um, you know, think about how you tend to uh, filter or group things, and that will be a good sign of probably how you want to partition things. Um, and the recommendations from Arrow is that you want to try to keep your files uh, larger than 20 megs per partition and smaller than two gigs. That does kind of tell you, you know, if your data is smaller than 20 megs, you're probably not going to get a lot out of Arrow at that point if they're telling you don't make any of your partitions smaller than that. Um, and it does, it says try to keep it less than, or uh, uh, don't go above 10,000 files. Um, a lot of times, though, you're not you don't necessarily have a lot of control on this, but they're telling you, you know, don't over subdivide because you're not going to save time if it has to go through thousands and thousands of files or, you know, tens of thousands of files. Find everything. All right. Uh, so we, we had that Seattle library uh, data set we downloaded. Um, what we want to do is we're going to group by to define our partition partitions, and then we're going to write data set to save it as the parquet. Uh, we'll set up a path in our folder here, and we just take that Seattle CSV, which is already loaded into Arrow, group by checkout year, and write data set to our path in format parquet. And that's it. That'll uh, create the parquet version of the file. I can't, I, I ran this. I don't remember how long it took. It wasn't too bad. It was definitely quicker than the download. Uh, but this is a like one time time investment that it takes a little bit of time to sort it out. But then once you do it, it's done and it can can be much faster after that. Like you said, mm -hmm. I will probably have to go to the arrow documentation and all that, mm -hmm. but maybe you have an idea because if you have 
this one is a big file and with let's say everything you need but what what about if you have logs for example by by month or by year or whatever and um if you have to download the csvs and then they are big and then you will add them to an arrow so or to a parquet format so would it be possible to to download and add to the different because you already partitioned the first time and now you are adding and uh, maybe if you partition, I, I, I understand you partitioning in rows and now you are downloading in, in columns, sorry. And now you are downloading new rows. So how do you know if that's... Um, the If you're downloading new rows, you're not going to gain anything, I don't think, because it's... Well, so if you had a whole new partition, like a new year that you wanted to add to the data set, I think in theory that would work but i haven't i haven't done that um but i i actually i do i did i have some gigantic data sets of like multiple csvs that i haven't finished i i know that i can make them better using uh parquet and i suspect that going doing something kind of like that where I'm adding into an existing parquet data set is going to be the way to do it um so probably <laughs> but I don't know the answer in this chapter doesn't go into it okay well, yeah we'll go to the documentation and see. <laughs> okay all right uh so these save as this Apache hive uh uh whatever format style of naming so if we look at the file names it makes directories that are that tell you what the partition is so it, this is the directory of files that have checkout year equals 2005 and then it has parquet files inside of there um, it could have more than one parquet file per directory depending on how big your data set is um, and yeah that's that's the basic idea of what it does here to to make this subdivision and that's where i'm saying I could imagine you could do, you know, like this and then separately do this. And when you go to load it, it should work fine, I think, because they're separate files. Um, but I haven't actually done that. And actually, I'm pretty sure that is something I need to do with uh, some data that I have. So we, I will find out at some point. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then, so we can do basically the same thing we were looking at before with this Seattle parquet, where we just open data set, the, the path that we set up. And so it, it opens that entire directory as this one data set. Uh, we can filter, group by, summarize, arrange, whatever. Um, and when it creates this query step, this is where we're going to look at it before we actually collect that it says it's this file system data set and it's a query. It knows these are the things it's looking at and, you know, like, this is what I'm going to do. So that's the pre-collect. And then if we actually collect that, it does the work. Um, and we're going to look a second at um, the speed difference. But, you know, it's kind of neat. Uh, it, we split that up over a few slides. But if you look, you know, you're just, just doing dplyr work and it's uh, working with this giant, giant set of data, uh, which is pretty nice. Um, the book, he says that there's this, uh, a Cero, a, 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 I don't know, even know what that word is supposed to be and why, why that is the thing to look up. And so I checked in, it has aliases, one of which is arrow hyphen D player, which is way easier to remember to me. So that's what I recommend doing that. You can look up what they have translated basically. Um, and this is where I was saying that, yeah, they have D player most of dplyr they have some some art um things to look out for within it and then they also have a bunch of other kind of random things like they have lubridate um they have uh stringy and string r really some pieces of it are translated um but you'll notice and we'll talk about this a little that there's no uh tidy r there's no per wouldn't necessarily make sense but there's you know just dplyr as far as the kind of core of the tidyverse. And I realized 
it appears that Acero is the arrow query engine, is the name of the arrow query engine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I figured, I mean, it had to be something. Um, I don't think it shows here. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't. Yes, yes it is, it's there uh, at the fifth line or so. Oh, okay. Um, but it, there okay. is the, your yeah. list of um, right. aliases. So arrow verbs, that's also a pretty good one, or, or arrow functions. Um, so uh, anyway, th those are all the aliases you can use to find that same thing. Um, I had, oh, I, I just realized that I stopped uh, being good about suppressing the uh, the numbers on these. So I'll deal with that in a minute. Um, just looking at the difference, I, I made kind of, he has two different pieces in the book where he does the um, CSV version and then the parquet version, but runs it through all this same stuff and does a time on it. I just showed that as X. And when you do the CSV version, it's about 12 seconds. The parquet version is three tenths of a second. Um, so big difference. Like it's uh, orders of magnitude faster to work with the parquet files. So it's worth um, setting that up when you can. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah, Acero as in steel. Uh, steel arrowheads. I don't know. I don't know why it's a Cero. Um. All right, and then so this is the last thing in this section or in this uh, chapter that they talk about using DuckDB with Arrow. That there's this to DuckDB function within Arrow that it takes your Arrow Arrow in memory representation of the parquet and just makes it into a DuckDB. Uh, representation under the hood it's like creating a duckdb connection that is connected to the parquet files um so you know that's nice and the thing i wanted to bring up and we discussed a little bit before we started recording of why uh they don't really go into that they just say you can do this and it's nice uh and the only thing I have found so far is if you need to do um, like tidy R things, if you need to pivot your data set, it's the main thing. Um, you can't do that in Arrow. Like Arrow will just fail versus DuckDB and other DBI or DB plier backed things can do that. So maybe that's why you would do this. Uh, it is slower with the, the test. You know, if I run this thing, um, it was on my machine. I mean, it was slightly slower. It was like 0 0.1 seconds for Parquet and 0 0.3 seconds for DuckDB, something like that. Um, DuckDB has some slightly different limitations on the um, that we talked about last chapter that it doesn't really know about the difference between NA and null. Um, little things like that. I don't know if anyone has anything else. Go ahead, Floris. <laughs> Well, I've also been asking myself the same question, <laughs> but I think that DuckDB, or at least the DuckDB R interface, is a bit more mature. And um, also because it's a database, you can store multiple tables. And right. Perhaps, but point. I'm not uh, familiar enough with DuckDB. Perhaps you can also define keys and relations, but I don't know. Which would then then you could take advantage of that in R as well. And, and Theoretically, if, yes. And at least you can then bundle multiple data sets together in one data set. I, I think that um, database, it might be a bit more that, uh, nice to do that in that way in R. That feels like it's getting there. Uh, I might have to play with that with uh, the one data set that I'm trying to pull out of CSVs might make more sense in DuckDB. So that's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't, especially the arrow to DuckDB part of this versus just loading it with DuckDB directly because DuckDB can load from Parquet files directly. So I don't, I don't know. I don't totally get this. Um, yeah. If you want to do experiments, you should definitely also have a look at that which I 
at that ADBI driver, yeah, uh, which I did not try yet, but uh, it's worth considering. But because also it should be faster, at That's, least if it was already yeah. arrow, and even if it's the DB's um, schema, it's it's very related to arrow. So I guess it's also very efficient to go right. back and forth with the arrow uh, setup, and so that would be more efficient to keep it in arrow and mm. first apply the queries etc and 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 then convert to a data frame yeah uh, makes sense probably so it'll it'll be interesting to play around a little bit uh, oh, yes. i was a little disappointed in that last section of the book because it was definitely a hey you can do this thing not which I feel like they're pretty good in most of the rest of the book of here's why you want to do this thing and did not get that at all on that part of the book. So um, still TBD there. Uh, like I said, there are a million talks. I have not paid a lot of attention to DuckDB or Arrow. Not, it, like they've been a growing thing in the R community over the last couple of years, at least probably several years now. Um, and I don't know, I'm at the point where I need to figure out, okay, what's going on and watch some of the dozens and dozens of talks that there have been about uh, working with them. It is something though, where for a while it has felt like uh, it was maturing and now it's pretty mature, you know, it's mature enough that both of them made it into R for DS. Uh, and so time to learn, I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, one other function that I find interesting in arrow is um, the s arrow table. So s underscore arrow underscore table, which can take a data frame, for example. So if for some reason you have a large data frame, which you still have to handle further, uh, process further in R, you can convert it to arrow and then perform queries on it. and. I've done it once and it was a bit faster. Well, okay. But yeah, if it's really representative, I don't know, but it, it was a little faster. Interesting. <laughs> so yeah, that's another perspective, I think. So coming from an R data frame, uh, making it an arrow uh, table. <laughs> so it, there's a lot of paths, ways I think you can try out and, and compare. Yeah, I wish they would get to the point where um, you know, they have the, kind of the wrapper package that figures out what format you need things to be in to do all the things, and then it just converts it. You know, this was what will be fastest for what you want to do. Uh, just uh, wait a <laughs> half a year or one year, and I think <laughs> Escape will have changed already. Yeah, I, and I, I, yeah, so that feels like a, a direction things are somewhat going. So uh, definitely, you know, it'll be interesting. I haven't checked um, if there are talks. I mean, I'm sure there's at least one arrow talk at uh, posit count this summer. And so see what's new uh, arrow and duck DB. Actually, I think there's probably a track that those two will be in. So I uh, have to watch and see. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's we're getting to the end. Well, actually, I don't know what was written last. That so the order of the book chapters isn't necessarily the order that they were written in. I, I was watching some of the development, and they didn't entirely go in order. Um, and we'll see. I'm hoping the quarter chapters will probably be pretty good because this came out while they were like promoting Quarto. So, uh, we'll see. Um, but yes, I will definitely, um, well, just probably right after this, I'm going to go pull up the schedule and see what I can find as far as what would be kind of an add-on to this conversation that maybe I'll have to go see. Um, and they're pretty good about putting everything online eventually, at least. So uh, should be able to see the talks at some point. Let us know. Let us know. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it is really funny. Uh, some of this too, like this stuff was under active development as they were finishing the book. 
And so they were trying, I'll bet they had to rewrite things a few times <laughs> as they were uh, finishing up. So, yeah. Uh, but it's there at least. It is, it's a really helpful starter, but I don't think it takes you over the finish line to really understanding how to do all the things. Um, I think you have to read a lot of documentation that you don't necessarily need in other chapters. All right. Well, cool. Um, I will uh, see everyone on Slack if there are no more questions or comments. All right.